uranium is a very weird commodity. It's similar to lithium. It's considered a critical element. Yeah, there are geopolitics involved. Mm-hmm. So who's your logical buyer going to be if you're a uranium? Because you're not going into production this cycle. I'm sorry, but this is not, that's not going to happen. Um, and so, and if you are going to go into production, you have to be in a place where you can get permitted quickly and nobody's going to push back. And to me, that suggests Africa. Hey, Sultan, how's it going? Great, Andy. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming on. Let's lead with let's lead with the energy sector, oil specifically. What are your thoughts on that? And let me set this up too. Is when we spoke, oil had a great run, and you said, "I'm out," or "I wouldn't touch this. It's just too hot for for you at the moment." And uh, oil had a significant pullback. It looks like it's building a good base here around 70. Yeah. Um, but if you had have asked me, I would have never thought we'd, with everything that's going on in the world, that we'd get back to 70. So I, I was quite surprised. But you had a good call. What were your thoughts on that call? And uh, what are your thoughts now? Yeah, my thinking at the time was uh, there, there was a line of thought that, you know, we had exhaustion in. U.S. shale and specifically in the Permian, and it was going to roll over. Um, and until we see more evidence of that, it's not something that I'm willing to take at face value. And uh, I, I think the other piece of this is the demand response to hundred dollar oil. Like I just, um, you know, it's a bit different than uranium, which we're going to get to, where the demand response is it's it's an inelastic thing. You have to put uranium in your reactor if it's going to go. Um, I feel like with oil, um, you know, particularly for Titan Cog, when these like gas prices or whatever, there's always a response, right? You know, people are going to fly less. They're going to, they're going to drive less. There's, um, you know, oil uh, prices translate to gas prices that trickles down into everything that we buy. You know, and there's always going to be that demand response when prices go up. Right. And we're seeing that with um, inflation of goods and services. So, right. Um, uh, so to me, I, um, and I think most people who, bought oil are probably doing okay. Like, you know, cause if you were buying your oil stocks that they're profitable, like 60 or $70, like then, you know, that was just outsized profits and you're probably fine now. Right. And uh, right. I, 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 I think it's that marginal producer that, you know, people looking for torque. Um, it's a thing that happens a lot in Canada where the mid tier Canadian producer, or the smaller cap Canadian producer, it's the, uh, the dream of having it, you know, kind of go parabolic. Right. Whereas, uh, I, I think for long-term investors, this is a bump in a buying opportunity. Or uh, if you're Warren Buffett, I don't think he, he stopped buying Oxy. You know, um, uh, if you're a Canadian and you want to own CNQ, that's 50, 60 years of reserves. You're going to be fine, right? And uh, 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 I, I think with something like oil, it's super volatile. I think there's a ton of it. Um, I think you're seeing that trickle down to natural gas prices. I, I, I. I don't know how you can be a bull on natural gas here. You know, just with all that associated production and. Uh, what I'm taking out of this is uh, it's a show me story uh, until producers show the discipline to stop drilling and flooding the market when prices go up. You know, we're, we're, this is this is the kind of thing that's going to happen. Uh, the uh, uh, the stuff that's going on in the Red Sea, that's interesting, but I, I don't think it's a move the needle situation right now. I, I think the other piece that maybe people aren't understanding is... Uh, um, you know, there's a temptation to look at the Houthis and say like, oh, well, the U.S. goes into these areas and, you know, they're on, they're on, um, they're, they're on their home turf. They're going to, they're going to get their ass kicked or something. And I, I don't see that here. I, I think the difference between engaging on the open sea where there's, you can't use hit and run attacks versus um, engaging the Taliban on their home turf or engaging in a place like Vietnam in the jungle or something. Those are orders of magnitude different. And I would point to something like Gulf War One. Where, um, you know, if you extend somebody's supply lines over a desert and there's nowhere to run um, up against conventional U.S. military technology, you can't stand up against that. Right. And I see a situation here where uh, the Houthis are being attacked by uh, the number one air force in the world is the United States Air Force and the number one, the number two air force in the world is the U.S. Navy. Right. So it's uh, right. uh, uh you know, and, and you're you're seeing these strikes, and um, you know this is different from a hit and run attack. You can you can try and 
use long range missiles. And I suspect this is, uh, um, you know, the Houthis will have funding and equipment as long as Iran wants them to. And if there's a, uh, if Iran's going to get something else out of it, some sort of negotiation or whatever, and I suspect this will go away. That's just my initial take. I could be wrong in a, two months from now and, you know, maybe a bunch of si ships get sunk. That to me is kind of the wild card if we have um, something there. But I, I, I think for somebody who's not a shipping expert, it's probably too early to tell. And I would say it's on the whole, um, I don't know what your take is, Andy. This is probably a good buying opportunity in the long run. I, I think it's just a matter of perspective. I, I, and uh, uh, it, it goes to that whole thing of there's no bad assets. There's just bad places. And I think a lot of people maybe got caught out buying mid-level, uh, mediocre oil assets at maybe not mediocre prices, right? And yeah, yeah, that's really, I think I share your perspective in one sense. I mean, who knows what's going to happen over there? Um, well, let me just address that first. Um, I'm trying hard not to have an opinion uh, because I just don't know. All I know, it's, it's a hot mess and that could have, but again, just looking from an investor perspective, who knows what happens, right? And so it's, it's, it is a wait and see. I see it as. Um, the thing is that I'm settling on with oil. I do see oil as a buying opportunity as far as energy stocks are concerned. That being said, I, and I was surprised, and I am surprised, but I guess they go back to the price is the price, right? And there's a reason for it down here. And you can scratch your hand all you want, but the price is the price. Yeah. And I think when, and I was a, a buyer of oil assets late last, I want to say last um, springtime. So I, I'm fine. Yeah. But I guess what I'm trying to, to say is I expected it to go up significantly more and it didn't, but that's, that's okay. But the, really the lesson is buy distress and then, you know, sell, sell the rip or lighten up on the rip. And I wish I would have lightened up more is yeah. as a good way to say it. Yeah. And, and I, I think the other thing that I'm realizing with oil is there's such a difference in quality, right? If you get acreage where um, you know, and I'll go back to Oxy as a, as a large cap example, they're never going to have to look for oil in our lifetime, yeah. right? They just, mm -hmm. they've got so much in the ground. Um, uh, in Canada, CNQ, you know, there's 50 years of reserves up there. Um, it's in the ground. They don't have to go looking for it. It's just a matter of printing money. Uh, 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 I'm actually very curious to see how this stuff works out with um, Hess and Exxon uh, in Guyana. Um, I think that's a buying opportunity. I think ultimately, you know, geopolitically, I don't see a situation where Venezuela invades Guyana. Um, I think that's more maybe for the domestic audience. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so if there's any distress there, that might be an opportunity because it, it just seems like a very interesting, um, uh, you know, opportunity set in terms of like the amount of oil and gas that just seems to, uh, that's available for exploitation in a place where you know, it would change people's lives. So you're not going to get that pushback, that environmental pushback about extracting the resource out of the ground. And, and that's so important, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, these days it's, uh, uh, it's a lesson I seem to have to keep learning over and over again. Right. That, yeah. That's like, and that's something I've really learned is like, where, where are you looking, you know, what, what's the jurisdiction and how important that is. Um, and I, as I think about this and then talking to you, you remind, you remind me a lot of uh, Warren Irwin, who was pretty agnostic on the macro. I mean, I'm sure he did have opinions, but he's hesitant to sharing them. But there's just, and I'm learning this because I'm a macro guy, I guess, um, is you just have to, really the money is made, I think, now in talking with him and just thinking of Warren Buffett and yourself is in the micro. Get a good company at a really good price. Yeah. It's really hard to go wrong. And you can certainly have a macro outlook. Yes. Which I do. But that is more or less, that's the tailwind, if you would, or that's the wind in your sails. That's not the reason why you're buying. You're, you, if you're bullish on oil, who cares? You yeah. just don't buy a bunch of stocks. You need to, if you're buying stock, if you're buying companies, you never really love the company. Yeah. And so and you hit on a very good point there. Um, I think a lot of people buy oil and then they're, 
their thesis, uh, an oil stock, and their thesis will be something like uh, uh, Canada's getting more pipeline capacity and uh, this other thing is happening and they're paying down debt. And then I look at it as, well, everybody has that pipeline capacity coming online, you know, uh, and right. they're paying down debt. So what differentiates your company and how are you going to outperform the commodity? And so when I ended up lightening up, I, I probably sold too early, but the idea was um, I made a 3X on Meg Energy because it was a balance sheet deleveraging story. Mm -hmm. Sold. Uh, it ran up a little bit and came, came back to where I, I bought it. And the idea was, I think this is going to perform with the price of oil going forward. So if I want to buy, uh, if I want to outperform the price of the commodity, then I need to invest in something else or I need to uh, just buy USO or buy some options. And I, I, uh, I'm coming around to this idea of uh, buying quality, buying uh, a ton of either ore or oil or whatever the product is in the ground um, and uh, making sure that um, I can outperform the commodity. You know, the, otherwise, yeah. why am I taking on the management risk uh, of, of doing that? And, uh, you know, and it really narrows your universe of stocks because in order to outperform the commodity, you need really good management or interesting management or you need a really severe discount in it. And it narrows that universe uh, a lot. And it, it, I think it makes it easier to screen for outperformance. Yeah, you, I was going to say, it makes your job a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you say no, you can say no for any reason. But man, if you're going to say right, yeah, say yes, you better be right, right? <laughs> but right. Yeah. So, well, hey, let's let's transition to uranium. Uh, we brought that up. And that that had a, uh, a big run um, starting in June, if yes. you would. Uh, things have leveled off, but not really sold off since then. But this is the, the uranium really scares me right now. And uh, I was talking to another analyst just recently, and I would agree with him. I don't think that run is over, if you would. That being said, I wouldn't be chasing here. Yeah. Um, and it's no longer, it, I guess the lesson I'm curious to your thoughts uh, is twofold. Number one, I'm just not going to chase. Number two, when things do move, just, I mean, you want to accumulate because when they move, they can go really, really quick. Yeah. And that's what happened to uranium. So yeah. What are your thoughts on uranium? Do you still like the, uh, do you still like the market and are you looking at anything? Uh, so my uranium, uh, exposure is kind of twofold. So we talked about the bit about this last time I have, um, a company called Centris Energy, which processes fuel rods. And so that's more nuclear fuel cycle. Um, and the reason I own that is um, that with the world the way it is with Russia, there's no refinement of uranium happening in Russia. That's where most of that capacity lies. Um, this um, technique that they use in order to enhance um, uh, the fuel at Centris is, uh, uh, is something that Russian technology used to take care of. So I think there's a demand for that. I think for geopolitical reasons alone, I think there's a lot more room to run there. Um, I own Kazatom from. Uh, and that's a controversial name. There are some people who think that they can't extract as much uranium out of the ground as they say they can and meet demand. I, this goes to a philosophy of, I want to own the last man standing. Um, okay. uh, uh, you know, them and Cameco, like they're just, they're going to be the last man standing. Right. And so outside yep. prices, when you can produce as cheaply as Kazadam Prom has in the past, uh, it's also a state run company, which can be good or bad, but in this case, it, uh, that dividend accounts for a big part of the state budget of Kazakhstan. Uh, there's obviously a uh, geo location there, uh, that, so which means they can feed China relatively easily. Sure, yeah. I like fire. Yeah. Um, I've, I've owned Kazatoprom for years and uh, it was down for a while. Obviously, just recently, probably cr across my buy price and has moved up significantly from there. But uh, yeah. uh, but I've been paid, you know, and, seven, eight percent on my money that entire time, right? And so right. it makes it a lot easier to own something when um you're you're getting paid. I uh, if I was buying uranium juniors and uh I think you know this, uh we're in a bull market now. A lot of things are a lot of people are getting into the uh juniors are getting into the uranium market or changing their name to put the word uranium in it and uh <laughs> yeah. yeah there's little credit. So uh 
if I was going to own a uranium junior, I traded something called Global Atomic, which is a developer in Niger. Okay. And the reason I was, it was a trade just because there was a coup in Niger, the price dropped. I stepped in with, with the idea of this is, this is underpriced for what it is. It's an asset that's going to get built. Uh, I sold it for, I probably sold it too soon. It kept running for obvious reasons. Uh, and my personal opinion is you want to be careful where you own your juniors, right? Because uh, uranium is a very weird commodity. It's similar to lithium. It's considered a critical element. Uh, there are geopolitics involved. Mm -hmm. So who's your logical buyer going to be if you're a uranium? Because you're not going into production this cycle. I'm sorry, but this is not, that's not going to happen. Um, and so... And if you are going to go into production, you have to be in a place where you can get permitted quickly and nobody's going to push back. And to me, that suggests Africa. Right. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, Africa is a place where uh, the governments could use U.S. dollars. Um, they're not entirely opposed to mining. Um, generally, you can get the locals on board if you're not awful at it and you, you, you do your CSR properly. Uh, and in most cases in Africa, if... Uh, we're talking about Belt and Road Initiative. So your logical buyer of China isn't going to be blocked on U.S. security concerns, Canadian security concerns, Australian security concerns. It, now, they may be Canadian, Australian, U.S. listed, but it's very simple for a, a Chinese company to take a stake in the project directly. And not saying that you can't get blocked by your government. That happened in Canada with a few lithium juniors. Their Chinese partner was blocked, but... Uh, well, that's uh, kind of the point, though. Let me let's talk about that is like you got blocked in Canada, but Africa, you're probably not going to have an issue. Yeah. Which I find. Uh, you know, I wanted who was I talking to about well, anyways, I was talking to another guest about that who opened my eyes about Africa. And that's such an issue now. I'm glad you brought up permitting, just getting the permit and weaving through the government bureaucracy. And then they'll just kill it or they can just kill a project. Whereas Africa, you alluded to, I mean, the. the they need your money. They need some dollars, U.S. Yeah. dollars or Canadian, whatever. Yeah. They need currency. And so your odds of getting permitted are, are significantly higher. And then also what I like, you know, I don't want to steal your train of thought, but what I like there also is like, okay, there's a coup, but even let's say the new government comes in, they're going to need you. Yeah. So it really comes to a point of how cheap is the ass in it? And are you going to be compensated for that risk of instability? Yes. Uh, no bad assets, only bad prices, right? And uh, yeah, right. I, 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 I have come around on that and I absolutely believe it. And one of my goals for, for this year is to become very well versed in African geopolitics because I believe- You me both. Yeah. How crazy like is that, right? <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's not a homogenous region. And I've made some really good money over the years stepping into uh, things that had have kind of sold off. And, uh, uh, you know, if we're talking specifically about uranium, especially with uranium, you have the Sprott Uranium Trust, you can just buy the physical metal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's so easy. Anybody can do it. It's over, it's OTC in New York. It's on the TSX in Toronto. It's uh, it's a click of a button. Uh, and I think it's over 30 bucks. I closed today at probably $32 Canadian. Um, uh, so that's the chart. That's the baseline. So if you're going to take the risk on a junior, uh, or, or a company with execution risk, uh, how much more do you have to be compensated? Because you can buy this hockey stick on the exchange, buying futures or anything, uh, you know, and if you want to uh, get a little fancy, you could put a little torque on it, maybe buy, put a little leverage on it somehow. Um, so, uh, you know, so there's no risk here or very minimal, it's just commodity price risk on uh, the Sprott Uranium Trust. Uh, maybe there's interest rate risk if you wanted to buy with margin or use some options or something and you could really juice that return. So going down the risk matrix, if we want to buy a uranium junior, what does the return have to look like? Yeah. Uh, you got to be 10 times, I would think at least. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I, I suspect, uh, when you're going to buy uranium juniors, just given the environment, um, you can't put all your money into one, right? So now you've got 10 or whatever. So it's, uh, um, and I think where most retail investors fall down is it's not about being an, a good analyst. You have to have portfolio construction. And that was something I maybe learned later than I should have, you know, I've overweighted certain things over the years and you get, uh, get bamboozled by a management team or you don't account for something. And uh, 
more good analysts have gone broke by going all in on on a yeah. on a stock and then not not being accounting for um, a sinking ship or uh, um, an earthquake or you know and and uranium is Excuse me. yeah Brock, yeah I've I've done that so um, yeah. I've been guilty of that and uranium is so, the only commodity where tomorrow there could be a nuclear meltdown the price could get cut in half you mentioned offline and I'm curious about it. I really agree with you on this, but I want to work this out. And this goes into what we're just talking about right now and some of the lessons we learned is that you think this is going to be a stock picker's market moving forward. Why why would you think that or say that? There are a lot of commodities where my gut tells me it's going up, but uh you know, what's the wild card here, Andy, right? And when I think about it, it's uh does anybody really know what's going on with the Chinese economy? Are you 100% certain that it's going <laughs> to it's going to rebound? Are you 100% certain it's going to collapse? Mm -hmm. Um would you how much of your portfolio would you stake on that opinion one way or the other? Uh you know, too much in uh, past 9 months. Yeah, <laughs> uh, um you know, I and I you know, the, and the honest question I think answer to that is nobody really knows. Uh, you know, we all have ideas and we've all talked to people on the ground. You talk to people on the ground in China and they think it's awful. Uh, we've all heard the stories about demographic collapse and that usually in, involves a demand drop-off. Um, uh, on the other hand, Japan is one of the oldest countries in the world and you know they seem to do okay with automation, but it's a much more advanced economy. Uh, so there's a lot of things with iron ore and copper that I just don't know in terms of, it could go either way. Um, so uh, uranium is, I think, uh, uh, an interesting use case um, in that it's in elastic demand. They're building reactors. You kind of know where that's going to go. It's a small piece of the input price. So that, I think that's why people are so bullish on uranium. It's, it's kind of it's, as much as any commodity can be set and forget and mm -hmm. kind of set and forget. Oil, to your point, is fueled by demand. While the Chinese economy going gangbusters versus the Chinese economy going into the dumps, you know, the rain... Yeah, that range of outcomes is large. And so to me, it is a stock picker's market because you want to be positioned so that you can generate outsized returns if the commodity moves one way, but you want to have your downside protection if the, the economy moves the other. Uh, that can only be done through picking the right stocks or picking the right basket um, or, or just expressing the view in a certain way because uh, I would never buy oil futures or whatever. I just don't have any outlook on the price of the sure. commodity. I, I have a general idea of at this price, you're probably more likely to go up than down. But uh, um, it's not a it's not a view I hold strong enough to to you know buy oil futures. On the other hand, price gets cheap enough for certain oil stocks. Um, I'll, I'll pile in. I've done it before, and I would do it again, right? And. Uh, uh, and so I, I think on, uh, on a high level, that's kind of how I think about um, stock picking, why I think it's going to be a stock picker's market, because last year I was able to pick up some things that I think are generational assets at really good prices because they sold off. Uh, I would point to something like Philo Mining. You're, uh, you're probably f familiar with the, the Cunha district. This is the Lundin's big play in um, uh, copper in uh, Argentina and Chile in that area yep. of the world. Yep. Uh, South Pole. And there's a few of these companies that they spun off, NJEX, uh, uh, Jose Maria that they took private. Uh, and so, uh, but Philo is the the one with the massive hole. This is the one where in the investor deck, they have a picture of the Burj Dubai, and then they have a picture of how deep this hole goes, and the hole is deeper than uh, the Burj, right? So, uh, and I, I'll be the first person to, you know, drilling results aren't really my thing. So when it kept going from like $1 to $2 to $5, I was like, oh, I missed it. And Whatever. Now that the extent of this deposit, this is a generational asset. You can hold it for the next um, 20, 30 years. 40 years, yeah. Yeah. And so when it dropped to $18 and it was below $2 billion, like significantly below $2 million Canadian market cap, and this is the one deans are going to get the thing built. Uh, I, I sold tech resources around the, the time of the Glencore um, takeover drama, and I moved it into to buy this. Field. Yeah, I mean, it's the idea of I'm going to buy this generational asset for really cheap. And I would make the argument that the precious metals byproduct alone, gold and silver, coming out of a hole that big. That alone makes it worth it. Yeah, it's probably one of the biggest. If that was an independent gold and silver deposit, uh, what That'd would be that be? 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. And so, uh, I just on that alone, that's the thing that I want to own. And I, and, and I, and I love it, something like that. Cause I can just put it away. I know it, it's, uh, uh, the copper price in the short term will fluctuate, but that's a, that's a mine that's getting built. And, uh, yeah. um, and that, I think that's a good example of stock picking versus trying to time the macro, um, uh, you know, cause those, those kind of opportunities don't come along every day. Cause Adam prom is another one. I just, uh, you know, you own this generational, uh, uranium asset that just, it finances an entire nation. Right. And, um, I owned Petrobras earlier last year. I, I probably sold it too early, but it, that's a similar, th it's, uh, uh, just trading at three times earnings. It was, uh, something that had come up on the screen and people had been talking about it on Twitter and I did enough research to understand what the, what the value prop was there, was able to make good money on that, probably sold it too early, but, uh, um, uh, so I, I think in terms of a stock pickers market, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, the right asset at the right price so that the price movements don't crush you. Now I'm, I'm more cognizant of, uh, fund flows and, mm -hmm. uh, broader supply demand in the, in the, in the, the longer and intermediate term. And, uh, um, uh, you know, and just understanding that your stocks aren't going to go up if there isn't liquidity or anything coming into the market. And so it doesn't mean you don't buy stocks. You just have to kind of use those times to accumulate and be prepared to sit on what you own and understand what you own. So you can sit on it potentially for years. And, right. uh, uh, but yeah, because commodity stocks are not like normal stocks. Like you, you, if you look at it and this is a, a thing that I would tell any retail investor, you know, professionals have to measure themselves in 12 month increments because they're, they're running money for people. And there has to be a score yep. that's universal across the board. You yep. know this. Yep. Uh, if you're a retail investor uh, and you're investing in commodity stocks, your commodity stock could do this and then shoot up. And uh, for those who are probably listening to this, I'm like, you know, going in a straight line and then it goes hockey stick. It's just, you can hold it for five years, have a good five-year IRR, and it could do nothing for three and a half. Right. And, uh, and that's just the nature of the way commodities work. Uh, and so the uh, question is, are you going to, are you going to wait until it starts to move and pile in? That's a strategy and that's a valid strategy. Um, are you going to use that dead period to accumulate? Uh, because you know what you own and that's also a strategy. Uh, it's, um, you know, I, I think there's probably some combination of both that makes sense. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, so to, to get back to your question about the macro view and uh, why it matters is, uh, you know, if there's no shortage of the commodity, then it, it doesn't matter, right? And so you do have to have some opinion of where the price is going to go. Um, uh, I'm more confident in the long run price of copper than I am in the long run price of oil. Or natural gas. Yeah, or natural, yeah, particularly natural gas. I, I just don't know how anybody can uh, um, buy a natural gas stock for the long term here. And, uh, you know, just the amount of associated gas and, uh, you know, we were supposed to be in a natural gas shortage because of uh, Russia and, uh, you know, and clearly Russia is getting the royal to market. So it's last year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, I think to me, the, uh, um, that macro view has to kind of inform my long-term uh, thesis, just so I can have a baseline price that I know can be supported for, for oil, it'd be like 65, $70. If you're making money at 65, $70, I'm generally um, okay to buy. I, I think structurally it's gonna, that's kind of the floor and that's the mm -hmm. way I look at it. So if, uh, uh, for copper, I, again, I, I think the long-term structural price is probably up in the, in, in the, uh, short or medium term, you know, it'll really depend on China. So it's about buying. Uh, that's, that's why you're accumulating here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and that's, that's ultimately what you want to do is, um, have that view, but, uh, um, uh, being able to express it in a way that you can, uh, take advantage of the constraints of other people. And that's usually, they can't hold something cause it's too small. They can't, uh. Um, you know, professional money managers have to dump out of certain names at certain times. And, uh, if, if you can use those things to your advantage, you, you can, you can do very well without having to take on the risk of, uh, financing greenfield exploration. Yeah. So, uh, with the exception of copper, what, uh, what are your favorite metals uh, as of right now? Are you, are you bullish on gold and silver, the precious metals, or even, even some of the more industrial metals like silver? or even nickel, what are your thoughts on those? I like gold here. Um, I just, not because I think it's going to go to 3000 or I think that could happen, but I mm -hmm. actually like gold here because the floor has been set. 
Um, yeah, that's I a mean, great point. I, I was just having a conversation yesterday. I just think the floor is in, let's say 1900 yeah. to two grand right there. I'd be accumulating. Yeah. So I just think it's low risk, right? Absolutely. Here. Yeah. And, uh, uh, if, uh, gold royalty company, there are certain smaller gold royalty companies that look really interesting to me here. Um, uh, you know, how do you value a gold mine, say in Africa, high grade produces a lot, but it's in a sketchy jurisdiction that's going to trade at a discount. Uh, what I think we've all realized is the royalty on that same mine doesn't trade at that same discount. Right. Right. So, right, right. Um, yeah. uh, and you're not taking on the, uh, uh, you know, there's still the risk. The mine shuts down. There, nobody's getting paid, but uh, you're, uh, you're you're taking on less executional risk of getting people in and out, uh, 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 dealing with security concerns, that sort of thing. Uh, so I, I really like gold here because I, I I do think the floor is in. I, if we see 1800 again, I, I'd be surprised and I would be trying to buy whatever I could. Um, yeah, I, I think another. I'm not a lithium or iron ore. Um, uh, iron ore I'm a bit more constructive on I, I I think lithium I go back and forth on that Andy because I, I do I, too yeah I I'm, just, I'm confused about it right, yeah I, I think there's real substitution risk here right and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the science tells us that lithium isn't maybe the best metal to put in a battery but that's the best we have um, right so, you know and the price of lithium has definitely come off on the one hand I could see people yeah so it's either a buying opportunity or um, uh, there's something else structurally wrong. I don't feel like I have an advantage, so I'm not looking at lithium. Um, um, I, I think copper again, I, I don't know if the floor is in, but we're, I think we're pretty close to the floor. I, uh, I would agree. Um, I agree. it's, it's one I'm watching and I would like to, uh, if, if there is a significant drop, I would, I would push in on some high quality copper assets, maybe more than I have now. Um, I, Uranium, I think, is structural. I don't own uranium juniors. I have other ways of playing it, but I'm very comfortable owning my nuclear uh, servicing company, I, uh, my uranium enrichment company. I own a, a company uh, that owns a royalty on a couple of uh, Australian mines and uh, owns a piece I of mill. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I really like those uh, picks and shovels play so I can kind of avoid the more sketchier parts of the market. Sure. And um, again, I think the bottom is in on fertilizer. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't have an opinion, but yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and specifically in the nitrogen based fertilizers, the, if, if the, your input, your main input is natural gas. Yeah. Considering where I think the price of natural gas is going. Right. Fertilizer right. can be difficult because there's different types of fertilizer. It's a regional market. Mm -hmm. uh, there's shipping factors in with, for a lot of people. And uh, it's a two-step commodity because, you know, if you're processing nitrogen-based, you need natural gas as feedstock, right? And so, um, but I do think that uh, the floor is probably in here and I can see it going higher. So I would be uh, comfortable buying certain types of uh, fertilizer assets, right? And, and, and I, I think to me, those are kind of those commodities. I'm not a big silver person. I, I just personally... Don't look at silver as a precious metal. I look at it as an industrial, an industrial metal. Industrial metal. Yeah. Also my product. Again, I think there's substitution risk there with silver. If silver went to, we'll call it a hundred dollars. Everyone talks about silver at a hundred dollars, right? So we'll call it a hundred. Mm -hmm. I think that's insane. Um, uh, most silvers turned into silver bars. There is a, a price where people would take their silver bars and convert them into industrial feedstock. I also think that's a big use of silver is solar panels. Yeah. Uh, on the industrial level. So there's substitution risk because copper actually works better. So there is a price yeah. where um, you're better off using copper in these solar panels. It's a better conductor. It's uh, right now silver is used because it's cheaper in the, in the amounts that they're using it. Um, uh, I own a tin stock, but I'm not a tin bull by any means. It's just, again, I bought a world, a world-class asset. There's a lot of opportunities. I, I, there are some commodities I, I'm more bullish on than others. And I really think it matters. Uh, to what we were talking about earlier, I, I really think it's a stock picker's market. So you can make money in a variety of different commodities if you choose properly. And for me, you choose wisely. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's about avoiding mistakes. And to me, and I don't know enough about lithium. So to me, that's lithium is something I'm going to avoid. Yeah, I'm going to avoid it too. I'm curious, but I'm going to avoid it. Um, yeah. I just don't feel like I have an edge and I just, I just don't know enough, but I'm, I am interested. So how do you feel about coal? I had an analyst on 
it's a good question. I had an analyst, well, just recently, um, on Monday, he was very bullish on coal. Yeah. And his reason was that most of the world, that's, that's the product for, for energy. And it's the most, it's the most economically viable product. And so you can say whatever you want about coal, as far as environment, about, um, taking it out of the ground about what, what the long-term prognosis is, but the reality is, and again, the numbers are the numbers, right? The reality is, is most of the world runs off of coal. I mean, Africa is, we're talking a lot about Africa here. Um, they're not, ru- they're not running off of uranium, you know, they're not, um, or, you know, I mean, and then all of this that happened with, uh, with Russia and Ukraine and everything, I mean, Germany was importing, from what I understand, they were importing a lot of coal. So, yeah, you know, and, and coal is also, an, if you're looking at assets as far as just a negative perception, you know, and those tend to be places where you want to look, you know. Now, do I own any coal? No, I don't. Um, yeah. <laughs> but if there was a, an asset class that would probably be at the top of my list, I would tell you right now, I w- I'm very interested in coal and it's just yeah. for everything that I just mentioned. Yeah. So. And I, I feel the same way. That's why I asked because I don't, I don't feel like I own enough coal, especially considering what the returns have looked like for coal. Yeah. And I couldn't tell you why I don't exactly. own it. Uh, uh, but I really, I really think that there's uh, you know, to me, that's a structural market. Okay. Nobody wants a new coal mine in their yep. neighborhood. So yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's one where you got to pick wisely because you don't want uh, why deal with a small cap. Coal yeah. My cost. You don't need right. to, you know, and all the risk too involved in that. But then if you get an established coal that has, I don't know, 50 years of coal production or, or whatever, I mean, it's hard for me to see you losing, you yeah. know? So, um, but again, I, for the record, I don't own any coal, um, but I'm ve- that would be probably my number one interest if you were to ask, well, you are asking me uh, right now going into the new year. Yeah, and I, uh, exactly. And it's, I, I'm, I, I have to figure out the best way to play coal. And uh, I, th- I think it might just be a matter of not being stupid and just buying the largest producer is dividend. I think so producer. I think that's exactly what I would do or am going to do. Is I would yeah. just pick, I would just pick the big guys because I think that's that's where safety. But you're also going to get, um, and it's even more to safety. I think you have a, enough leverage there. So, but I, I don't know yet. So, another interesting factoid about coal is um, you don't need a pipeline to transport it. it right, it, right. It fits on a train. It yeah. fits on a boat. Dude, yeah. you know nobody's stopping trains or boats from transporting this coal. Right. You have a bunch of coal just sitting there on a stockpile. You have to. Uh, because it'll, it'll, it, it bursts into flames if you keep it too long, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things to like about cold. Like, like, yeah. Uh, the ancillary yeah. processing. And so there's probably, uh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to do a bit more research, but the idea of my, my ideal state coal company would be the one that, uh, probably something in Australia or that just puts the coal on a boat and floats it to whatever market's willing to pay the most. Right. And, yeah. Um, somebody's, it's, it's, already this, somebody's already done this research somewhere, but that's, I think to me is the ideal state play. Yeah. And it, it's easy to understand. I mean, you just broke it down that again, that's Warren Buffett. You could write it on a napkin, the back of a napkin. And yeah, yeah it's just easy to understand how it's not complex. So, well, Hey, I want to thank you so much for your time. I've kept you too long, but any, uh, parting thoughts here, any, um, yeah, any, any words of wisdom here going into the new year? Uh, I, 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 I think it's a stock pickers market. I think it's one of those things where fund flows are going to matter. And by fund flows, I just mean, once we kind of know where demand is coming from, you know, people are going to pile into the sector. Um, I would encourage people to get a better understanding of geopolitics because I think as time goes on, uh, politics changes, politicians change, rocks don't, right? And ultimately, if the rocks are in the ground, um, uh, just based on some of the things that I own, um, I didn't intend to take on a ton of permitting or geopolitical risk or permitting risk, but it was just a series. Uh, when I looked at my portfolio at the end of the year, I had 
a junior called Monero Alamos and they're having a permitting delay in Mexico, but I think that's going to solve itself. So I've been adding to that. Um, I own something called Salazar Resources. That's, uh, um, they own a free carry in, uh, on, a, on a large mine a, a deposit in Ecuador. And uh, Ecuador has been having a lot of problems, but there's a new recently new government in there. And uh, the family of the prime minister, the new prime minister owns a piece of this mine. So I have a, I have a funny feeling it's going to get approved. It's going to work out. Yeah, yeah it's all going to work out fine. I really do think that um, uh, there's opportunity in um, understanding permitting risk or understanding geopolitical risk, because uh, I agree. if you, if you, you know, because if you can establish that the rocks are already there and something drops on a temporary a uh, concern that is going to sort itself out in the long run, you have a chance to step in and make a lot of money. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, my big regrets from last year were actually selling winners too early. I, I sold to something called Global Atomic, uh, owning a, a, a mine that's being built in Niger. Uh, I sold Petrobras, again, that was trading at three times earnings, um, Brazilian state oil company because the new government had come in. And uh, if, I'd sell, if I was still holding both, I'd be collecting a very nice dividend and probably... Uh, sitting on an even nicer capital gain. Capital gain. So um, I, I really do think it's a matter of uh, uh, just being cognizant of uh, funding risk and being cognizant of geopolitical risk. And that's the other thing I would tell people to avoid is any junior miner or any resource stock that requires an injection of money from the capital markets to me is a hard avoid because uh, we're not in an environment that's conducive to people going to the market and getting good terms. Right. And, right. Yep. 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 And the Completely exceptions good. are the, yeah, the exceptions are the things that prove the rule. The Lundians can go out tomorrow and raise a billion dollars. Right. Uh, ABC, ADX, mine too. So no, they you. absolutely can't. Right. And uh, my biggest losses last year were on companies where I, I realized maybe a bit too late that they didn't have the money to get over the line. And yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that is the issue right now. That's yeah. the number one issue. Yeah. So. And, uh, there might be some money to be made by, uh, stepping in after these things, maybe yeah. money else out. Uh, but you know, you have to understand the cash flow situation and who's going to run out of money before they, uh, mm -hmm. have to put another drill hole in the ground or get their mine up and running. So yeah. if, you can, if you can understand that cash flow, capital markets risk, and you can understand you have a better understanding of geopolitics than the next guy, and you can differentiate between Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and ECOWAS, then you're, you're, you're way further ahead. If you can understand um, CSR risk on the ground in Ecuador versus Peru versus, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, different states in Argentina, uh, different provinces in Argentina, and how they function differently, uh, it's a huge advantage because most people can't. And uh, uh it, it doesn't, it doesn't take much. And if the rocks are already there, you can step in and buy, you, you're going to get an opportunity to buy uh, yeah. some interesting assets at prices that you're going to really love in two or three years. Excellent. All right. Well, Sultan, uh, how can people find you and uh, get a hold of you? Yeah, probably on Twitter is probably the easiest uh, way to do it. Uh, at Sultan Amorali. Uh, I apologize. I haven't been on Twitter too much recently. I've been, uh, uh, speaking of capital markets, I've been, uh, uh, trying to deal with an activist situation where I didn't want to be an activist, but I have to get my money out somehow. So I've been working on that for the last little while. Um, but uh, probably Twitter is the best way to get a hold of me. And uh, I also have a sub stack um, that you can find off my Twitter profile easy enough to find. And uh, I do a bit of long form writing there. Excellent. Well, I'll put uh, links to both in the show notes. So I want to thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Andy. You bet.